Dobrý den, dámy. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and fans of Agora. Welcome to the already 14th run of our conference about using information and communication technologies for users with a severe visual impairment. My name is Radek Pavlíček. I work in the Theresia Center and I will be guiding you this morning. To start with, I would like to thank, to extend my thanks to everybody who uh, has time for us in your schedule today or are watching us from the archive and would like to learn something more about the news in the field that our conference is about. Well, I'm welcoming both end users and as well teachers, expert uh, employers from universities, nonprofit organization employers, uh, employees, our project partners and everyone at all who, has, who is interested in this topic. Thanks also to all the lecturers who have prepared a very interesting contributions in which they're going to tell us uh, or let us know about what they or their companies are doing in the field of assistive technologies for the visually impaired. I would also like to thank for help uh, promoting our event to my colleagues from the Third Age Univers uh, University Department of Masaryk University, Association of Librarians and Information uh, Employees, PMI Associations, Blind Review, uh, Czech Blind United, the Slovak Blind United, the European uh, Blind Union, the Touristic Information Center of uh, the Brno City, and to all the volunteers and fans who have spread the information about Agora via their social media, in their companies, in their families, in their social circles. Great, thanks for that. Also, of course, thanks to my colleagues from the team, because Agora is not a one-man show, but it stands, fortunately, on very firm uh, foundations, thanks to the interpreters who took care or uh, who made it possible for you to watch today's broadcast also to those who do not understand Czech. So my thanks go to Lukáš Hosnedl and Pavlina Soušková. Thanks to my colleagues from the Special Informatics Department, Tomáš Bukovský and Jirka Letocha for all the technical support and uh, preparations of this broadcast. And also, of course, thanks to my right hand, so to speak, to Anička Hořejší and Pepa Konečný, who also belong to the closest organization circle and have done a lot to enable us to keep organizing, especially the, uh, the in-person runs in the form that they have. And last but not least, thanks, of course, to the partners of Agora, without which it would not be possible to organize our event and uh, develop it further because you who have already watched Agora a couple of times, I believe you do perceive the, the, the development, the growth, the improvement that uh, we constantly keep doing and for which we strive. Thanks to the Sesnam CZ company, thanks to our volunteers from the IBM company. Great thanks also belong to uh, two to our two main key partners, the Czech Radio Endowment Fund, which has uh, supported Agora for a long time from the Svetlushka or the Firefly Fund, and to the Deloitte company, which uh, for several years has already been our uh, key partner and uh, they uh, have a great stake at um, enabling Agora to reach the, its current form and state uh, to those of you who watched Agora last year, you may remember that in this introductory uh, blog, Bara Minova was talking, the pro dean of the uh, Faculty of Information Science, who's one of the, let's say, mothers of Agora, because it was her doing that we could uh, connect to the Delight company in the fall of 2017 and start planning together on how we could find, uh, how we could go about organizing the event together. And today I would like to welcome another of the, <laughs> let's say, uh, founding mothers, uh, Senta Cermankova, the Innovation Director, 
the uh, innovation director of the Deloitte uh, Czech Republic and Central Europe company. Sinta, if I can ask you for a couple words and your view of things on how you perceive Agora from the position of the key partner. Uh, thanks a lot for the floor. Greetings to all the participants. I wish you a very nice morning from our uh, Prague headquarters of Deloitte. We are, we are a very proud uh, partner and donor since 2017 already. And it's not just because you're or we like you, but it's also because we have common strategic or educational and innovation um, goals. We are a company which, uh, of course, we know you as a strong consulting company. You know us as a strong consulting company, but we are a company that changes, likes changing, we like the innovation, and we keep uh, progressing together with you into technological uh, areas. Over the last two years, we've even opened up and invested into eight internal startups. So we have supported internal uh, costs of our partners, and now we help to create them. And uh, besides that, we create uh, clubs or social clubs, I would say. You may, you may have heard, and I would like to greet all the participants of your uh, conference this way and also invite them to these, our, uh, these clubs of ours. We uh, make clubs for children which are open to new ideas, new areas. And we also do clubs for ambitious women that doesn't ha don't have to be just uh, women in the in the company elite positions, but it can also be women who are at the beginning of their careers. We also do clubs for uh, the elderly. And today, maybe some of you may uh, take part along with us uh, in the club Fast 50, where we're going to appreciate the 50 fastest growing companies in the on the Czech market. Uh, business. Besides that, I also uh, heard you have a lot of teachers at your conference. So I'm also a university teacher myself. I teach at the uh, University of Economy uh, International. Uh, I teach my students critical thinking as well as uh, learning of people, machines and organizations. And I, why, why do I say all of this? Because with the new calendar year, we're about to start up a new club where maybe we can also uh, arrange some collaboration along with Agora. We're going to uh, go to high schools, to visit high schools in the entirety of the Czech Republic. We may even expand to Slovakia and we are going to teach kids critical thinking and how not to get scammed or uh, influenced with fake news. So I've uh, checked out and learned about your conference, all the program. I like all the programs a lot and I would like to spend a lot of time with you, but unfortunately my schedule is really full today. But uh, my sincere greetings to all of you. I'm looking forward to fo uh, further collaboration with Agora and I wish you to uh, have a very nice day uh, today at the conference and to enjoy it. So, Senta, thanks a lot, not just for the nice words, but also for your, especially for your partnership and for being open to further ideas, uh, further collaboration uh, and expanding that. I'm very happy for you having mentioned also this, the group, the target group of the elderly for mention, have mentioned the schools. Uh, yesterday, I also talked to your colleague, Gabina Havlikova, about other possibilities where we could meet and join further. So once again, uh, thanks a lot, both for your introduction as well as for being here together at Agora and for being for liking each other mutually because I think it would not work without that either. So thanks a lot. You, you who are regular participants of Agora know that one of its uh, strong points and the reason why we started doing Agora in the first place are users with a severe visual impairment because we want for all the possibilities and technologies that are available today to be available also to these users and for them to know about the technologies to be able to use them efficiently and for the technologies to help the users in their lives and uh, for the users to be able to use them uh, above all to compensate for their several severe visual impairment. Let's not 
delve into details here now we don't have the room for that but if we take a look at how the possibilities of using mobile phones by visually impaired have progressed over the last 20 years then the progression is something truly amazing in my opinion and i'm glad also we are able to uh, contribute to people about visual impairment knowing about all these new developments and in order to confirm and verify that what we do is truly beneficial to these who are the primary target group of Agora. Uh, for this reason, I would now like I would now like to um, uh, ask to speak up and to evaluate how this uh, uh, goal of us, how we're doing it, uh, uh, to ask Radim Kharavat, the regular participant of Agora, who is visually impaired himself, so he falls into our primary target group, and Rajim works as an ex assistant expert at the international and European law department of, at our university. So Rajim, if I can ask you to say a couple of words from the perspective of the one who has experienced Agora and has been with, with it since it started. Good morning to all, to everybody. Uh, thanks, Radek, for the floor. <coughs> I would like to briefly look back in my uh, brief introduction into the past, into the year 2015, where Agora was, uh, let's say, kind of a baby in diapers. And uh, when we get back to this date, to today's date, the current date, I don't dare say Agora is adult yet, because even though it's already grown into two days, uh, not even though, but when it's grown into two days, I thought it was not even possible to expand it anymore. But Dr. Petr Peñas then uh, proved me wrong when he was mentioning that the capacity of the buildings have not been fully used yet, that there's also still the upper floor. And in not too long, we had the plenary session of Agora, and Agora keeps progressing further. And I'm very glad about uh, for that, because if I were to sum this up from the position of myself as a user, then I see the benefit in two on two levels or uh, scopes. First, uh, it's uh, receiving or gaining the information. I, as a lawyer, uh, do know all too well myself how much time it takes to find a specific information, to uh, kind of uh, order them or classify them. And I got a specific just exactly in the regard that it brings the information to us directly on a silver tray so I can uh, focus on my private life and my work and my family and Agora brings the most recent information from the assistive technology field. And the second part where Agora is also very beneficial, but this part, however, I have to emphasize cannot be realized, unfortunately. Uh, due to COVID, but we have to deal, all of us have to deal with this situation. And that part is the practical part. And it means that at the workshops, one can get to know not about just some app existing or being available, for instance, for smartphones, but also how that app is used and controlled. Or if you, if we learn at the plenary session about some new aid, or tool, then when it was uh, still possible, of course, and I do believe that in a couple, uh, in a short time, it's going to be possible again, then uh, we will be able to touch the aid, let's say a braille display, uh, to try it out, which not even the best description can substitute for this fact. So thus, I'm very pleased, and I'm saying this honestly, that Agora is here and what a benefit it has i think i'm talking also on behalf of a lot of us uh blind the blind who are agora participants and to conclude i would like to uh really relieve it or loosen it up a little bit because uh to me 
Uh, the lyrics of the Chinaski song was not clear for a long time where they sing the best things are free. But in the case of Agora, I've uh, already understood it completely because Agora is for free to us participants. And uh, truly the benefit that I was talking about is uh, just significant and fantastic. And uh, in this way, I would like to extend my greetings to you. Uh, and it's clear to me that Agora is free to us users, participants, for us users, but that uh, there is not just a lot of huge effort on the part of the organizers, but also uh, significant financial support from the partners. And um, I think I'm. I would like thus to extend my thanks to both of these groups, and I think. Uh, all of us users should thanks for this. So I wish for Agora to keep growing and doing well. Radim, thanks so much for the nice words. And uh, there's nothing else left for me than to keep uh, to go on thanking. Uh, it was just yesterday when we were preparing this broadcast, we agreed with our colleagues that we like doing this and it makes sense to us. We really do see the practical impact on users. And I think these are the, I can also speak probably on the behalf of the entire team in this, uh, these are our most motivating factors that power us up and thrust us forward, give us, keep giving us the strength to keep making Agora in the form it has. So once again, thanks a lot. And our last, uh, last, uh, presenter in this block, in this introductory block, as has become a tradition, is our landlord, so to say, the director of the Theresia Center to aid students with specific uh, needs, Peter Penas, without whom it would not also be possible either, because we may have sponsors, friends, partners, users, we can have an excellent team of experts, we can have inter interpreters, we can have all of this together, but if we did not have the support of the management, I think all of it could uh, either not succeed or even not be at all. So great thanks to Petr for having supported this activity of ours for uh, many years already. And I would like to ask him for a couple of introductory words. I uh, wish all of you a very nice day. I'm very glad to be able to see or meet uh, again. And I would start by saying that I'll try to, to uh, contradict Radek a little bit. For me, the greatest pleasure in connection to Agora is the certainty that certainty that I'm useless here. This certainty has been given to me by such people as uh, Radek specifically. So thanks to him, thanks to the Deloitte company and all the others who support this. And that certainty that I could not have been is what I see as a very nice present when I see everything that works out well, how things can work. And it also gives even to me personally uh, a certain joy out of life, just as uh, this goes for the fact that I can meet people at this uh, event or with this opportunity that I've been meeting since ages for ages and who have always been uh, uh, um, the inspiration for my life. So the participants who gather here today in a certain sense, some of them might have been my students or pupils, but mo most of them have been my teachers because never in the 19th as a beginning tutor at Masaryk University, I uh, have encountered them and so uh, such people like Radim Kharvat, who was talking a little while ago, asked how it all was, how it all works from the point of view of a user. And I was trying to understand things. And then what I learned uh, to and to put what I learned into uh, relations or connotations and try to gain some useful tips and strategies for schools and other institutes that we're working with. So for me, it's a huge experience to realize that something works, keeps working still in the same way. 
meaning I still keep meeting the same people and I'm still grateful for them to them for being able to learn from them greeting I greet them at this opportunity but other things on the other hand keep moving forward very quickly uh, such as um, exactly the technologies what I sometimes feel sad about is that from my point of view the school itself does not probably change as fast as the technology does and it would definitely come in handy for uh, schools to be able to easier manage with the situation than it can currently. Uh, the situations that we find ourselves today keep uh, convincing us that there's still a lot of potential and room for improvement because it's obvious that when we don't have practically any other option than to meet in this way, there's nothing left than to deal with the situation and uh, mine <laughs> everything we can out of it. Of course, one of the possibilities that can be can be gained out of it is that if we meet up in this way, there can be more of us than the capacity of the building is where we where Teresias. Uh, resides, uh, the building that Radim was already joking about here, that I was trying to always use its capacity to the maximum. And now that we have all the all the space, all the premises available, it's uh, uh, an area for potential growth, but it's also important to keep watching uh, or to make sure that we don't lose other things in the process. And that's where the interest of the school and of those who develop assistive technologies meet up or where the interests converge and i'm very grateful for agora being here that gives to schools the possibility to get inspired thanks to everyone who uh, took care of having another run here and i wish you all to enjoy it to the fullest Petr, thanks a lot also to you both for the support and for the for being here with us i think it's uh, really truly great and helpful and just like uh, or similar to you i'm looking forward to the next runs and to being able to gain the most out of the both worlds as we've already talked about to reach the practice that Rajim was talking about and as well as for us for there to be more of us and to be able to connect even across continents, which is just the case of our first lecturer, the regular participants of Agora may have had the possibility to uh, listen to the contributions from the colleagues from the Netherlands, Denmark, Israel. And today we also have a, a guest from abroad who has, who is going to open up our the, our the program of today's Agora and this lecturer, this guest, is the CEO of the Falling Squirrel Studio, Dave Evans, who is going to talk to us about what experience he's gained and what knowledge he's gained, what they've dealt with when implementing and designing the first fully blind accessible story action adventure that has no graphics and thus is a game that can be played even by the blind the, uh, first of all i consider the introduction to be finished this way and the programming part to start and I would like to ask the uh, uh, studio for the first introduction uh, for the first contribution. Hi, uh, my name is Dave Evans. I am the studio director at uh, Falling Squirrel and I'm here to talk about um, a little behind the scenes making of uh, The Veil, Shadow of the Crown. And uh, I've entitled this uh, talk Unveiling the Veil. So uh, first of all, uh, the Veil Shadow of the Crown is an action adventure game with RPG elements. Uh, it's also audio based uh, and the audio aspects of the game um, center around uh, combat in which you are a, a, a swordsman or a warrior uh, that's armed with a sword 
uh, or melee weapon and a shield, and you are surrounded by enemies, that uh, you have to listen very carefully to what they're doing and where they are, and then you act according, accordingly, swinging out at them or blocking their attacks and counterattacking, that sort of thing. Uh, and then there's, also, there's also an exploration component to the game where you um, explore uh, various parts of this game world. You'll be exploring, let's say, uh, an open um, village square where you're listening for um, different beacons around uh, the environment, um, looking to talk to people, gain, um, uh, take up quests, um, or you're in a dungeon setting where you're listening uh, to the environment to find uh, your objectives. The uh, focus uh, during development primarily was on uh, having a high quality audio experience, uh, starting with the quality of the voice performances. Um, and uh, we also wanted there to be a lot, uh, quite a bit of uh, emotional narrative uh, within the game. And uh, we also wanted to make sure other elements of the game, like the, the menus and those sorts of things were, um, uh, were truly accessible for, for someone who uh, cannot see. So uh, what did we set out to do? Well, initially, um, we wanted to, at least I wanted to tell uh, a story from a unique perspective. Um, and as a sighted developer, um, uh, this unique perspective was um, playing as a, a blind protagonist. There was also an aspect of doing an audio game that allowed me to explore a relatively substantial narrative story um, relatively cheaply. And uh, we also wanted to play to the strength of the team we had, uh, writing, and uh, that's that was the core of, of uh, the experience initially was that it was going to be uh, very story centered and uh, we we're going to have a lot of different characters and um, I, I was really looking forward to working with um, really great actors and, and creating a, a, a great uh, game world through, through their uh, performances. Um, so after uh, uh, early uh, focus testing, um, which was uh, started at the CNIB, which is the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, um, we obviously discovered uh, more things about our game. But we discovered that, yes, there was indeed an underserved audience um, that did not have a, a ton of higher quality content when it came to uh, video games. And uh, there was a definitely interest within the community. There was also um, uh, two ma major groups within the community that um, we were introduced to. One was uh, a group that have, have played video games, a lot of video games, audio games, uh, found ways to play games that were not um, meant to be accessible in particular, um, and really wanted um, uh, more content and challenging content. And, and then there was a, another group. There are quite a few people that came out of curiosity. Um, they had not played video games before. They had sort of assumed that this medium was sort of um, uh, not for them or not uh, certainly wasn't accessible for them um, and they were trying a video game for the first time uh, over time we realized this was a truly novel experience uh, for in particular sighted players um, they had never played anything like this um, so even though it was advancing things that uh, the blind community had uh, encountered before um, it was brand new for, for many people in the sighted community um, and that was actually something I was, I was not expecting, uh, the level of novelty um, that these games held because I was a bit familiar with the genre before uh, starting to work on these games, uh, or this game. So what did we learn? Um, there was a, was a relatively steep learning curve uh, because I, although being somewhat familiar with some games within the genre and having developed video games in AAA and, and the indie space before, uh, I had ever made an all audio game. Um, there was uh, challenges um, to uh, the public demoing of this game. Uh, there was a challenge of knowing what players were doing while they're playing the game. We um, opted to um, set up a bank of uh, headphone splitters so that multiple people could listen to a single playthrough, I think up to four, so we could kind of keep track of what's happening um, and uh, step in and, and let them know about things. Um, because again, this was an early version of the game and we were looking for a lot of feedback at that time and we're, there people were running into more problems than, they, than in the final game. Um, there's also an issue with communicating to players who are having an all audio experience. Um, many people are closing their eyes and getting into the game. Um, so uh, if there's anything we've got to tell them like uh, someone else wants to try it or something. There's always this issue of like how do you, you tap them on the shoulder or whatever. Um, so there is this idea that we had to 
sort of preload people's experiences with all the information they needed uh, before they started playing because once they were in they're they're in um online focus testing uh was also something we had to figure out uh first of all we had to figure out where's where's our audience uh pretty much one-stop shop shopping um with uh us finding uh, audiogames.net um it, it's quite an active form uh of people who are looking to play audio games mostly within the blind and low vision community and we were able to uh post um about our game on the forum get people interested in playing the game and then once we had a group of people interested which was i think at the end up to two two to three hundred people were playing the game and a huge huge uh a conversion rate on people saying they wanted to play the game and people actually playing it and, and giving us feedback it was amazing um what else oh we we learned not surprisingly that um the community is is incredibly um diverse um there's a wide range of gaming interests and familiarity with gaming itself um so uh we realized that if we wanted to make a game that would uh, appeal to the community at large we would have to find a way to make it uh, uh quite a, a broad game in terms of appeal we also uh knew that we'd have to address uh certain narrative tropes uh, even the idea of, of playing an all audio game that has no visuals um as a blind character is already uh a trope there's a general consensus that this was fine um but, but the, the character needed to be um uh needed to be defined by by something outside of of the disability they have um and uh, i my feeling or my hope is that within about half an hour playing the game you forget that the main character alex is blind um she is defined by being a leader and someone learning to be a leader uh, a princess um, a sister those sorts of things become much more important um uh, very quickly in the game um and uh another thing is just working with people in the in the visually impaired community um performers with visual impairments um we wanted to make sure we included the community and all aspects of the game in terms of um, people on the design team um, but in particular from from a voicing standpoint um, I wanted to make sure we threw a really wide net out for for casting and uh, um, two of our actors did, did something that I'd never seen before and I, I found it amazing um, which was the uh, performance uh, to audio playback so they would listen to uh, robot voice and what's great about this is they don't have to memorize the material they just have to kind of listen to it once to get a sense of um, of what the line is similar to an an actor uh sighted actor pre-reading the line um but so they don't have to memorize it um they play they they um they do their performance as the line is being played back so they're hearing robot voice in their ear and immediately just ahead of each word um are saying the lines um and this is something that has to be practiced obviously um so uh from all this stuff we learned um here are the pillars for a game that kind of came out of this um so because of the broad appeal aspect of the game layouts were, were relatively simple um we wanted to place in the world uh clear beacons for important points of interest so uh the sound of where the objective in a, in a dungeon is let's say you're told you have to find a uh, treasure behind a waterfall um that's very easy to find but enemies in the world you have to listen to where they were to potentially avoid them or seek them out um and uh secrets and little surprises in the world um would also be um a reward for attention to detail um soundless objects uh, are never placed in direct the direct direct path of objectives so you would you uh, there were uh, bounds to the world um but they were well outside of the objectives uh so they were just really to keep people from wandering off into to nothingness we had a relatively shallow learning curve um uh, with depth you need to exploit more of the uh complicated things you might learn in combat um if you're playing on a hard level whereas if you're playing on the easiest settings um you it, it's there's a, a less you need to know in order to to um move on in the game uh the second pillar was em embracing the audio um audio game novelty the novelty of of, of an all audio game so uh close camp uh, close combat um was something that that the majority of encounters included um and this forced you to listen to subtle tells um when you were fighting uh, or moving through space listening to what kind of armor your enemy had would tell you who the enemy was listening for the type of sounds they made before they attacked let you know how many attacks were coming 
or whether or not they moved and then attacked, those sorts of subtle things. Interaction with the world uh, is intimate and responsive. Um, it's another uh, way of sort of embracing what, what we thought was great about uh, audio games. Um, so the NPC interactions themselves were always really close. They were right next to you. They would move around. Many of the scenes, we'd have them just move subtly back and forth. And, and the um, it almost created that sort of ASMR response uh, in the binaural audio where it just feels, they feel very present and, and real. Um, and the other advantage of, of all audio is if you have something that close um, in, a, in a visual game, uh, you're going to scrutinize so many things about that model, that character model. You're going to see that the mouth doesn't move perfectly. The skin doesn't look perfect. Um, but in this case, you close your eyes and uh, um, <clears throat> you are you are Alex. You are hearing a real person move around next to you. That's, that's how immersive it felt. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, players are rewarded for attention to detail. So um, the idea of having little sounds within the soundscape matter. Um, you hear a, a dog whimpering in a, in a in part of the uh, the town. You can walk over and feed it. It becomes your companion. So you get rewarded for for listening, which which also is forcing you to really pay attention to what we think is the best part about the game, which is this uh, the audio details. Um, the other thing we, that the uh, game afforded us, kind of as a byproduct of of a necessity, we had was that uh, narrative can be developed any, everywhere in the game. Um, so let's say you go to a shop in a game that. Uh, relies on vi the visual con convention of having um, a text-based um, menu for selecting from hundreds of different items. But because we wanted to really reduce the amount of uh, time spent in menus making these decisions, we had you know limited selection within a shop. So there'd be like four or five things to select from. Uh, and we needed to use audio um, to uh, enable that selection. And so we decided to have it um, unfold in world. So a interaction within a shop is developing your character as, as Alex, it's developing the shopkeeper. There's every shop has a unique person within that, that, uh, village. Um, and uh, potentially the, um, you're also developing the character of your partner who's, who's with you for much of the game, this character, the shepherd. <clears throat> so, uh, the challenges, um, that we ran into that we still haven't totally figured out is you know, how do you sell a game without any visuals? Um, it's so important to have, um, it's conventionally important to have a trailer that, uh, that sort of shows how, um, great your game is, uh, visually, cause it's usually a big selling point, but, but also there's a lot of, uh, selling scenarios where visuals are the only thing you have. Um, you're usually watching video before you even click on it and enable the audio. So. Uh, it's really hard to hook people into to a lot of the places where they could very casually come across your game. Also, how to balance this focus between the novelty of the experience of all audio and accessibility. Um, I think it, it can be balanced and, and we did our best to balance this. Um, but we did realize that there is uh, there is novelty for sighted players to, to enjoy this experience. The idea that um, I would have a real hard time picturing myself being comfortable moving around uh, a public space without being able to see. Um, and playing Alex allowed me um, to experience that without the anxiety uh, that I would that I would have. Um, and I think that's the experience of, of many people in the blind and low vision community is that um, uh, that it's it is something every day and it's something that uh, they're in, they're confident with and comfortable with. And uh, that was empowering to, to me. So there was an aspect of that. Um, and then the other side of that <clears throat> is that um, the uh, the idea of the blind swordsman trope, the idea that um, the disability provides characters with a uh, superhuman ability, I guess, uh, is something that we actually challenged in the game to some extent. Um, it was presented at the beginning. Uh, the origin of the magic in the game uh, comes out of this notion that maybe Alex is, is special because uh, of her disability. Um, and, and that's why she can do these, these supernatural things. Um, but uh, we undercut that at some point in the game. Um, where you learn that uh, um, it's it's because of her empathy is is where this power comes from. Um, that is why she's a great leader. That is why she has these abilities. It's because she's willing to listen to people and understand them. Um, <clears throat> so there's a little twist on that. In a way, this game was conceived as something you would play once or twice, uh, once on maybe normal difficulty and a second time on hard difficulty. And as a game that's meant to be novel for the sighted community, um, this was the kind of experience that made sense. Um, it was experience that you can enjoy, appreciate, 
uh, potentially like a lot, um, but you're going to move on to your next game. Um, within the blind and low vision community, there was definitely, um, because of the lack of content for the community, there's definitely an interest in, um, uh, in, in having more uh, content within this experience. Um, and people were playing the game eight, nine times uh, and enjoying it on the eighth and ninth time, uh, which was hugely exciting, but then problematic when I realized why well, I didn't let anybody skip scenes. Obviously the answer to that is uh, allowing allowing this um, things certain things to be skipped um, and then uh, also providing uh, potential gameplay. Um, I mentioned it here at the end, uh, PVP or arena modes or something uh, where people can, who just want to center on the combat or exploration or dungeon stuff, uh, can really jump to that gameplay and enjoy it. Um, so that's something we would add. Um, we also wanted to sort of explore untethered combat. The, the combat basically locks you in in a melee situation. Um, it was sort of our first pass on the idea of, of, um, of combat based on some other uh, video games that have been made, audio video games. And, um, but we, we do feel that we can untether combat to a certain extent um, and also in, introduce more narrative choices into the story um, for a follow-up game um, and uh, improved accessibility, um, potentially for hearing impaired and non-English speakers. Uh, again, it wasn't an obvious thing to uh, do because we were really thinking of the accessibility being centered around the blind and low vision community. Uh, but there, there would be people who are hard of hearing that could potentially enjoy this game or people that don't uh, speak English as their first language who could <clears throat> sort of generally understand what's happening in, in the, uh, with, from the uh, voice performance, um, but they can also uh, read along um, and, and understand more fully what they're talking about. Um, so again, not obvious things um, for us initially. Uh, and also it, it's a small independent game. Um, so we had to choose our focus and our focus was on um, the, the blind community um, for any aspects of accessibility. So um, I just want to conclude by uh, thanking you um, for listening to, to what I have to say. And uh, uh, hopefully there'll be a, a way of, of uh, you reaching out or contacting me if you have any questions and I'd love to continue the conversation. So thank you. And I would just like to add briefly for myself as Lukáš Hosnedl, if you're not following my website, forcensegaming.cz that I collaborated on this game as a consultant. So one of the ways you could contact Dave if you want to in check is via me, forcensegaming.cz all together, or you could write an email to me at h-o-s-n-e-d-l-l -L at gmail.com, or you can find the official website of the studio at fallingsquirrel.com. F-A-L-L-I-N-G-S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L.com where all their social media are also listed, Twitter, YouTube, Discord, and so on, if you feel confident enough to talk to the creators directly in English. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot to Dave and also to Lukash for organizing, arranging, making this contribution possible. Uh, because as I've already said, I see huge strength of Agora in the community and in that everybody is trying to contribute with their part and with what they are able, capable of and what they can do uh, for the event to succeed. And uh, with Lukash, except for perfect translations and interpreting for this run, it was also uh, contacting us with Dave and uh, organizing this introductory contribution. So thanks a lot to both of you, G uh, gentlemen. The following two contributions are headed in the area that we've already opened up here a little, uh, which is the area of smartphones, <laughs> of mobile devices, it's not necessary to introduce either one of the companies uh, in a lengthy way to the regular participants of Agora, both the Blind Shell company as well as the Corvus, a touch and speech company with have regularly participated at Agora with their products and in the following contribution Kristina Savarieva and Filip Hrlička are going to talk to us about the new version of the Blindshell Classic phone, 
which is numbered two. It offers the on the one side unique hardware custom made with tactile buttons. The phone has voice controls and very high quality loud speaker uh, making further apps accessible and so on. We're going to hear about all of this in the contribution in a moment, but I would just like to start or rather to conclude my introductory speech would like to mention the information which again connects us to our collaboration with the Deloitte company or puts this collaboration into another view because as Senta um, was talking about the Deloitte technology fast 50 competition and also the blind shell company took part in this competition in 2019 and they placed 15th as a rising star. So even on this level, we meet up not just with Deloitte, not only in terms of support, but also in terms of their collaboration or a selection of companies that they're choosing a company that also regularly takes part in Agora. So, so much for the Blindshell Classic 2 phone. And I would like uh, to ask for the next contribution. Hello, my name is Kristina Savaryova, and this is my colleague Filip Herlichka. We are from the Blindshell company, and today we're going to introduce to you our most recent phone, the Blindshell Classic 2. When making this phone, we worked very close together with the Czech Blind United or SONS in Czech. And it was not just the SONS who helped us with the phone, but it was also partners and customers all over the world. Within the recent years and while selling the previous model, the Blindshell Classic 1, we've gathered enough feedback to be able to make the new phone much better. And we managed to implement all this feedback in some way into Classic 2 and thus to make a unique phone. So let's begin by introducing the hardware and describing it in greater detail. We'll start on the upper part of the phone where we can find the LED flashlight, the headphone jack and a microphone which is used to eliminate background noise. The phone has two microphones. Uh, the first one is this one on the upper part and the second one is, is, is a standard microphone which records your voice during a call or during voice control and that one is located on the front part on the keyboard between the two, three, five and six keys. On the back side of the phone uh, we can find a camera which has been significantly improved compared to the previous model. Here we have a resolution of 13 megapixels compared to 2 megapixels on the classic one and below the camera there is an SOS button which of course uh, can be used in some emergency cases and can be associated with a specific phone number which will then be automatically dialed after pressing the SOS button and next to the camera we can see the flash itself. On the lower part of the phone there is a charging connector. Uh, newly we are using the USB-C connector which is a perfect thing because this cable can be connected, plugged into the phone in both directions. And this connector we use both for the charging cable itself as well as for the charging stand. In the bottom left corner there are two more little holes which are used to attach the keychain and in the bottom right corner there is a tiny hole which is used for easy grip to easily grip the back panel inside the phone there is a battery which can easily be detached by gripping it up here by a very small hole where you can easily plug your nail and remove the battery by the way the battery has 3000 milliamp hours which is almost two times the capacity of the previous model under the battery there are sim card slots there are two of them both of them are 4g and the format is a micro sim card and next to it there's an sd card slot which is a memory medium using which you can increase the internal capacity of the phone by up to 128 gigabytes uh, on the inner side of the back panel there's an NFC antenna and we use that technology for labeling objects to label objects and later we'll describe how that feature works in greater detail. On the left hand side of the phone there is a dedicated 
volume control button. That button has two positions, uh, up, down and up. The, fo the phone has 10 volume levels. That means that by pushing the lower part of the button, you decrease the volume and by pressing the button in the upper part, you increase the volume. The volume is used to control the phone feedback volume, but not the ringtone volume. The phone's TTS now says volume 7, volume 8, volume 9 and volume 10. On the right hand side of the phone, side of the phone, we have another dedicated button which has a dual purpose. When long pressing the button, the voice control feature activates. The phone says, I listen after beeping. Philip says, run WhatsApp. The phone says, opening WhatsApp. Welcome to the WhatsApp application. Philip speaking again. Oh, when short pressing this button, the favorites menu launches, or rather the menu of favorite apps, which is a great thing because if you use some apps daily or very frequently, you don't have to look for them anymore in any complicated menus or submenus, but you can just simply add them to the favorites menu and then these apps are available to you uh, by a short press of the right hand side button. Uh, up above, under the display, there is a speakerphone which is used during the calls and the display is not touch enabled. We've kept the button concept which has worked greatly in the past. Below the display there is a keyboard which we've split into two parts. In the upper part of the keyboard there are navigation buttons and below these are is the numeric keypad. The navigation part of the keyboard is designed so that it's as easy as possible for the user to orient. We've tested the numeric keypad when developing the phone many times with our users so that it's as easy to use and as comfortable as possible. We were focusing on details such as what specific shape the buttons should have, how exactly apart they should be placed, which pressure the user needs to apply to press the key so that the key is not too easy to press. Uh, or on the other hand, when typing messages, for instance, uh, so that it would not be too complicated to press. The phone says two, f five, eight, two. Christina, after the experiences with our previous model, we focused on the quality and loudness of the speaker. The speaker is newly placed in the front of the phone, at the very bottom below the numeric keypad, so that it logically faces the customer's ears and not the other way around as it was with the previous model. And the speaker is very, very strong. I even think it it's able to be compared even with the most powerful speakers on the current market. Software-wise, Blanchard Classic 2 is capable of everything its predecessor was. That means you can find, for instance, the favorite voice control feature here, where the phone can be controlled with voice commands as long as it's connected to the internet. And newly, you can also find uh, many features to simplify and enhance the quality of our users' lives. Newly, there's the WhatsApp communicator in the phone, a lot of assistive features such as a magnifier, color recognizer or NFC object labeler. A significant new feature in the phone is an app, blind shell app catalog and a screen reader, thanks to which we can gradually keep on adding and adding more third-party apps to the phone which were inaccessible in the previous models. And now uh, let's demonstrate how the NFC object labeling works. In practice, you can use this feature in the household when labeling objects of the same shape, such as two different tea boxes. The phone says, read tags, new tags, two or three. Uh, place the back side of the phone close to the tag. The tag has not been used yet. Add a tag description. Type object description, one of two. Record object description, two of two. Now record a short description. Christina says, green tea. The phone says, description saved. New tag, two of three. Read tags, one of three. Place the back side of the phone to close to the tag. And now we can hear Christina's recorded voice saying green tea. 
One of the optional accessories for the Classic 2 is a beeper. This small smart device can be attached, uh, for instance, to your keys or other objects in the household that are easy to lose. And using the phone, you can then make the device ring. The phone says, find beeper, one of three. Keys, one of one. Looking for the beeper. Stop ringing. And Christina says, using the button on the beeper, you can then stop the ringing. Blindshell Classic 2 is not just the phone itself, though. Included in the package are a lot of other gadgets and accessories. Let's take a look at everything that's included in the box. So besides the phone itself, uh, we have the charging stand, or a stand where you can plug the phone, keep it charging there and have it stable in one place. Three NFC tags are included in the package. Uh, next up, there's headphones, the USB-C charging cable, and a power adapter, and a keychain. In the package with the keychain, there's also a small metal hook for easier attaching of the keychain to the phone. Some things which are included in the basic packaging can also be purchased separately, just like uh, or as well as the cases and beepers. Thanks for your attention and we wish you a lot of fun with the Classic 2. Thanks a lot. You can also find all the information about our phone on our website www.blindshell.cc and if you have any questions, uh, do certainly t uh, write to us or call us. Hello? Thank you. And now we are hearing several bloopers from the shooting of the video as both Philip and Christina try and fail to say different parts of the script. Well, thanks to the colleagues from the Blanchard company and I wish them a lot of happy customers and users and we're looking forward to their next uh, news and innovations. In the third contribution, we'll stay in the area of uh, mobile devices, but this time we'll take a look also abroad, but just into the neighboring Slovakia, where the colleagues from the organization, which used to be called Stopka or STEM, and today it's called Touch and Speech, are going to tell them about the news in their Corvus kit application set which makes smartphones and tab android smartphones and tablets accessible to the visually impaired uh, among the news and improvements we'll find for instance the improved voice control text recognition um, media player on it or an intelligent or an intelligent coach which teaches the user to control the selected applications and as i when i was talking about the success of blind shell in the competition of the deloitte company uh, then a similar uh, feat or success has also mm, met the touch and speech company which has uh, succeeded in the grant uh, call of uh, the google company for the region of the central and eastern europe so i'm very pleased to see that in our part of the world in our czechoslovakia we have uh, the full <laughs> the lot of two successful companies, both of which are, I think, uh, significant players in the field of making smartphones accessible to the visually impaired. So, uh, I would like to ask to start the next contribution. 
Greetings to all the participants of the Fall Online Agora 2021 from the beautiful, amazing Lipto. My name is Roman Martinovic and I'm greeting you on behalf of the entire team of the Touch and Speech nonprofit. If some of you remember that last May I was still introducing myself as a member of the Stopka nonprofit. No, I haven't changed my employer, but our nonprofit changed its name because Corvus is opening up to the world more. So we wanted also for the name of our organization to be more understandable globally. So we chose what characterizes our products, thus touch and speech. Well, but let's move on from our name to the supposed topic of today's talk. I believe you're going to endure with me because in the conclusion of my talk, a little present will come too. But for now, let's move to Corvus. Because since our last May presentation, Corvus has run a huge piece of the way by miles and bounds, also thanks to our donors, the Telecom Endowment Fund, part of the Pontus Foundation, the SK Nick Fund, the Slovak Savings Bank Foundation, our media partner Sugar, and other many supporters and fans. Also, thanks to them, since our last Agora, we've released five new Corvus versions, which has seen seven new apps added, 41 brand new features, and more than 80 other smaller changes and improvements. Recently, we've first of all focused on even more efficient and even simpler controls, and that's why we also added our own voice assistant, which listens and understands in both Slovak and Czech. Look for the book, The Little Prince. And now we can hear the phone reading out the results immediately. She supports running apps and macros, viewing information, for instance, about calls and SMS messages, activating and deactivating features such as, for example, the alarm clock or the timer, looking for books, looking up services in the timetables, looking information on Google or YouTube videos. Look for a service from Rožimborok, Slovakia to Brno. And we can again hear the phone reading out the results. But what's the absolutely coolest feature of Corvus is, in my opinion, the Braille keyboard, which can be used to write in the Corvus environment, but also in common Android apps. There are also such users who use another screen reader, but they started using our keyboard to write in their favorite apps. It enables writing not only in Slovak and Czech, but also in other languages, also typing special symbols and contracted braille. It supports using the primary and the secondary braille table. The braille keyboard supports two modes of work. These are being held or tabletop. The keyboard recognizes your fingers based on how you calibrate it. Another interesting thing is that when typing in the holding mode, you can specify whether dots 1 and 4 will be typed uh, in the usual way with your index fingers, or to some users it's uh, better or easier to switch these dots around and to type dots 1 and 4 with their ring fingers. Except for typing, you can also easily edit text with the keyboard. You don't have to just place the fingers on the screen, but you can also perform small gestures on the individual positions. Either you swipe your finger in the direction of your palm or away from your palm on the single dots or dot combinations. Based on that, you can delete the characters, move the cursor, move around in the text, copy, and so on. It's also important and outstanding that the keyboard does not have to be just primary, meaning you use it all the time. But let's say it suits you better to use classic uh, tab typing for shorter texts, and you can activate our Corvus keyboard only as your secondary keyboard, meaning it only activates at the time when you flip your phone around into the proper position in edit fields. And what's better about it is that you can also find our Braille keyboard in the Corvus free version, so you don't have to pay even a single euro for it. 
Brajlovskú klávesnicu nájdete aj v našej úplne bezplatnej verzii Corvusu Corvus Free. Among other control improvements, I will for instance mention three finger gestures which we've added to the home screen and thanks to them we can quickly activate even more features and apps than before. The possibility of uh, quickly opening URLs, email addresses or phone numbers directly from text fields with a simple press of the volume up button and tapping the display when the cursor is placed on a link or an email address or a phone number. So this possibility is one more of the control improvements we've done. Typing by selection is a special type of keyboard which is really, really very simple and it's meant for users who are looking for simplicity and not efficiency as much. Recently, we've also significantly improved controlling smartphones using an external physical keyboard. V poslednom období sme výrazne vylepšili aj ovládanie smartfónov prostredníctvom externej fyzickej klávesnice. New apps and features of course also got some love, always with the emphasis on high efficiency and control simplicity. We also think optical character recognition is another improvement in this direction. That works in a quick reading mode or document reading mode. Quick reading is such reading when you aim your camera into space or in an object and it doesn't matter which way the text is turned. The phone tries to recognize it and read it out to you. On the on the other hand, when reading documents, it already becomes important how the document is positioned and the phone reacts only when the document is placed correctly, but on the other hand, it tries to navigate you so that you can place the document in front of the camera in the right way. Our optical character recognition manages to recognize texts also in image files or PDFs. And the important thing is that you can also take a look into the history of recognized text. Whereas when using the popular lookout, for example, it often happens that you're not looking at the recognized text anymore, but lookout is still saying its thing. With us, you can stop the recognition and reactivate it again so that you're all always sure you're reading what's in front of the camera lens. Other changes in the Corvus environment include the timetable application, where uh, you can look for trains and buses in the Slovak Republic and Czech Republic, but also look at the service details, route and so on. Another cool thing are internet radios, which uh, make it possible for you to play thousands of radios all over the world thanks to the Radio Browse Info feature. More time features have also been added, for example, automatic time reporting or missed events where you can configure also which hours this automatic time reporting should work and when you're going to bed, for example. Our audio player has also been significantly improved. I will not hesitate to admit that we were inspired by Rockbox, which is popular among the blind when making this. And so we're bringing equalizer, voice pitch settings, special enhancements of the volume of old recordings that we can find, for instance, in some digitized books in digital libraries, playback speed settings, and directory playback where you can just uh, move over a directory and have it played or have all the files in it played via the context menu. Automatic bookmarks are also amazing, which you can configure both for the directories where you have books saved, which is cool for, for example, when you open this book and you start reading where you stopped compared to music files where this does not make sense. But these folders also include information about the equalizer, reading speed, volume, and so on. O ekvalizéri, rýchlosti čítania, hlasitosti a tak ďalej. Also, the phone app has been overhauled greatly. For instance, it supports smart loud listening or loud monitoring, which reacts based on whether you have your phone placed at your ear or you put it away from your ear. During the call, you can work with the phone and take notes, for example, or read out some contact information to the other party and so on. Next, you can return back to listening close to your ear. Given these 
these days is support of dual SIM phones. Many might be interested in the integration of Apple Podcasts into our podcasts and RSS apps. Also, the support for sound recording in the voice recorder app from different sources, which with some devices enables fully fledged call recording, but that depends on the given hardware. Our document viewer makes it possible to read PDFs, RTFs, Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, HTML files, and EPUBs. And in the book downloader, we've also added the possibility to access audio described movies and uh, looking for audiobooks across libraries. So you don't have to limit yourself with Corvus. It's prepared for Android equipped phones from version 6 to version 12, which is the most recent version, is prepared for the different models of different manufacturers and also other devices. Being visually impaired, we are very aware of the fact that every visually impaired person is different and thus every visually impaired person should have the right to choose their own device according to their own personal preferences, just like a sighted person can. This is another important factor of true inclusion as we see it and this is why another partner has joined us recently and that's the google company they chose 13 projects among more than 800 and among the chosen projects as the only slavic project is also our corvus it's a great honor for us a great obligation and for you users, this means a great acceleration of our project development, guaranteed stable and confident development even in the coming years, significant screen reader improvements. Here I dare say that even though our screen reader does have its bugs, so far uh, we'd like to make it uh, one of the best screen readers you've ever known by the end of the year. A more intense connection among Corvus users mutually and even more efficient controlling of other useful features that make use of the power and the intelligence of the new devices. And as I promised, we're approaching the conclusion of the talk so we can get to talk about the mentioned present. It's going to be more presence, in fact. It's going to be a kind of a Corvus party. The last larger Corvus version was 2021 2.0, which was released by the end of October. This version also includes the mentioned excellent Braille keyboard, which, however, doesn't make it possible to configure all the parameters of the keyboard in the free variant. So we've decided to celebrate the occasion of Agora to release a small version of Corvus 2021 2.1, which also to the users of our free variant will make it possible to fully use the Braille keyboard, including all the settings. We've also realized that many of you don't have the chance to evaluate the huge progress that Corvus has made recently, because you've already activated the Corvus demo sometimes in the past, and today, our activation server will not allow you to activate the demo anymore. Well, it did not allow you. Because on the occasion of this Agora, we'll deactivate this check on our servers for some time, and you have the possibility to activate a 90-day trial of Corvus again, regardless of whether you've used the trial before or not. I'll tell you this possibility will last until the end of January, so even to those of you who have already had the Corvus trial and you were perhaps excited to try the new features in the last version, but it was not possible because our activation server did not allow you. These days it will surely allow you. Please do give it a try again and if possible with the new Corvus version 2021 2.1. If you do try Corvus out, you might be considering purchasing the paid version as well. For many years, the paid version cost 248 euros. I have some good news for you because you don't have to pay 248 euros anymore, which is the largest price of a Corvus license we have. You don't even have to pay 98 euros, which is the common price of the Corvus effective license, which is bound to the device. Because uh, to celebrate our 15th birthday and also considering Christmas is approaching, 
we've decided to come with a sale of the Curvos Effective License, which until the end of January is going to cost only the amazing 24 euros and 99 cents. And this is a price that everybody can afford. Another possibility you still have is the totally free Corvus free variant. Corvus Effective Plus has not been changed either, although I can tell you internally that we are considering not selling this license anymore. But if you do have it purchased already, you don't have to worry, it's gonna stay unchanged. And who can you contact if you decide to get Corvus? You can make use of our website corvuskit.sk or you can reach out to our Czech vendor Ergones from the Olomouc town where they're also offering Corvus on sale for 627 Czech crowns. And once you have Corvus, don't hesitate to make use of our quality customer support services. We can help you configure the phone remotely, even install the whole thing remotely. We can do this for you using shared screen and you can also learn more about working with Corvus in the integrated trainer app. And you can also visit the web where you can find more than 50 tutorials about using Corvus and two e-learning courses, starting with the Corvus environment and starting with the Corvus screen reader. Korvusu a dva kurzy začíname s Korvus prostredím a začíname s Korvus čítačom. And to conclude, let me just thank you for your attention and express my hope for your feedback, observations, opinions, maybe suggestions for improvements and also my hope for us to finally be able to meet in person at some event. I hope it's gonna be soon already. For now, I wish you to stay healthy and to prepare for Christmas in peace. So I would like to thank the colleagues from the Touch and Speech company for preparing this contribution and in the first place for their activities they do in order to make the world or uh, mobile devices more accessible to the visually impaired. Also to Corvus, we wish a lot of happy customers and users. And if you would like to make use of the possibility to try Corvus out for free, uh, then I do believe that the Corvus kind of birthday party that Roman introduced is the right thing that will make this possible to you. Now we'll move on from uh, accessible mobile devices and we'll take a look at what news has emerged in the area of braille displays and note takers. Petr Blaha from the Symbio Access Devices company is going to introduce to us uh, the B Note, which is a new autonomous braille display on the Czech market, which offers a huge durability, high durability. Uh, and autonomous features that make it possible to use this braille display even independently without having it connected to a computer or a mobile device. And it also offers, for example, an advanced file manager or the possibility to read text documents in a whole range of formats. And more about this, Petr will already reveal to us. I'll ask the next contribution to be started. Greetings to everybody. On behalf of the entire team of the Symbio Access Devices, my name is Petr Blaha and we'd like to thank you for the invitation to this year's Agora. In this way, we would like to introduce to you a new Braille display on the Czech market made by the Eurobraille company, which I'm sure you know very well because its ESIS line of Braille displays have been present on the Czech market for a pretty long time already. I would even say it's been more than 10 years already. And this new product, which again raises Eurobrail's bar a little higher, is called B Note. So, as the name already suggests, it's not just a classic Braille display which we can use with the computer, but it can also be used for note taking. It has an integrated text editor. And furthermore, we can also use this Braille display as a 
document reader, for example, to read digital books, which we can obviously read in Braille, but we can also make use of audio and uh, while reading the books, we can also listen to them thanks to the integrated eSpeak synthesis. B-Note is being distributed in 20 cell and 40 cell variants, so it's up to everybody whether they prefer better mobility or on the other hand, more cells so that they won't have to scroll so much so often. B-Note has a plastic chassis, but the plastic used and this can be told by touch alone. It's uh, obvious that they're very durable, even when handling the display a little more roughly, nothing screeches anywhere, nothing presses in. So even if you are going to travel a lot with Bino, like I do, for example, you don't have to worry about anything getting damaged. Uh, about its weight, that is also a little higher than the ESIS, but nevertheless still quite fine for traveling. The 20 cell variant weighs 500 grams, the 40 cell one weighs 600 grams. B Note is also distributed in several versions, which are different in their features. The most feature rich one is called standard, then there are two more versions basic and light. The standard version includes all the features, that means the internal text editor, file manager, Bluetooth, Braille keyboard. The basic version includes only the USB and the keyboard. And the light version includes the only those internal features that are focused on reading and it comes without the keyboard and it's possible to connect it both via Bluetooth and via USB. We have the most feature rich variant of Beanode here, the standard version, which costs 89,900 crowns. And we would like to sell this one as the primary one because we think that all the features that it offers may come in handy sooner or later to any braille display user. We never know, we can find ourselves in this situation when we need to use the display also autonomously, even though we usually use it only with a screen reader. So if we were to describe B Note in a little more detail, then on its upper part, there is the braille keyboard. It has a dot which has a v oval buttons that are very easy to feel. Compared to the ESIS, it's been significantly improved. On the one hand, it's uh, a little quieter. We might as well just try it out. But above all, the buttons are far larger. So it's not difficult at all to find them, to locate them very easily by touch and type on the keyboard very quickly. Below the Braille keyboard, there are the navigation cursors, which have two pressure levels. So each pressure level does something different. If we press the navigation cursor only slightly, the Braille display scrolls forward by its length. And if we press the navigation cursor more strongly, then the cursor gets moved to the cell above which we press it. Below the navigation cursors, there is uh, the tactile part itself. So that's the Braille display. And below that, there are two more buttons. The left one is backspace and the right one is spacebar. Also on each end of B Note, there is a keypad. So there's one both on the left and on the right. And these keypads are also used 
to move along the document so we can choose whether we want to move using the navigation cursors or using the keypads but they are also used to move in the list of files in the file explorer app which bnode includes there are no controls on the front side of bnode or on the right side there are no controls on the back either so the only side worth mentioning is the left side where there is a sliding toggle which is used to activate the b-note then there is a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and a usb-c connector for charging and connecting the display to the computer regarding the usb that's also been improved a lot because uh, rather than the mini usb connector which was used at the isis there is usb-c here which among other things enables fast charging specifically after 25 minutes of charging be no charges up to four hours of usage if the battery is charged up to a hundred percent then b notes battery life is uh, approximately 15 hours which gives us we may say two business days of non-stop usage but in reality of course we don't use the braille display for the entire eight hours straight every day so that the time can be even longer if we were to take a look at the individual autonomous features that Bnote offers, then there is a file manager that of course enables us to perform these standard operations such as copying, moving or creating folders. But there is also another new possibility of packing and unpacking. For example, I tried to copy my library into Bino, which was packed and had about a gig and a half in size. And I have to say Bino was able to handle it pretty well because in about 15 minutes it was done, the library was unpacked and could be browsed in the file manager. By the way, since we're already talking about sizes, then there is a 64 gigabyte memory card in BNote, which means there's really more than enough space for books and potential other documents. Another app in BNote is the text editor. There, as I already mentioned, uh, we can take different notes, but uh, as opposed to the ESIS, the B-Notes text editor can also open various text formats. Among the most important ones I should mention uh, Word documents, plain text, PDF, EPUB. It does not work natively with these formats, but if we open such a file, then b -Note converts it into plain text and so, or we can read it subsequently and of course in the plain text form we can also edit the file another feature is an excel spreadsheet reader but that's an all new feature which has arrived with the most recent firmware version so we did not have time to test that one yet but until the workshop when we're going to be discussing bnote in greater detail i should already have some more information about this feature uh, in the text editor we can also use the, the mentioned listening or audio features what's great about this is that when we start reading the document the, uh, then while eSpeak reads the document, the Braille display also scrolls in tandem, so we don't have to scroll manually, but the reading does actually behave like uh, screen reading on the computer, for example, JAWS or NVDA. So where it's reading, there is the Braille cursor. Among other features, I could mention math, symbol, typing, 
viewing document stats. So for example, how many words, lines, pages, and so on there are in the document. And in Bnote, again, as opposed to the ESIS, we don't have the diary and alarm clock anymore, but the time and date itself are still present. As for the diary and alarm clock, I don't think we need to be especially sorry because these features are nowadays being used, especially on the computer or on the phone anyway. As I already said, Bnote is a novelty on the Czech market, but one of its great advantages is that the used operating system is Linux. So as for new features, these are undoubtedly going to be added and it will not be required we will not be required to get hold of a new hardware because of them thanks to Linux these new features will only be implemented via software updates Bnote is also equipped with a lot of various accessories we've already seen the rubber case at the beginning and from the other items I could mention the headphones and the power brick with uh, different dongles well, our time has come to an end, but uh, during this year's Falls Agora, we are going to be talking about Bino in greater detail on the workshop, which is scheduled for Monday, the 29th of November, 4.30 p.m. And we'll be glad if you take part in this workshop and we'll be able to talk about Bino in greater detail and discuss its features, usage and potential future plans. So uh, for now, thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to you at the workshop. So thanks to Petr both for his contribution as well as for his offer of the workshop, which I'll also remind, about, remind you about in the conclusion of our event today. And now let's move on to the next contribution in which Daniel Jungmann from the Gallup company is going to tell us about the device called Orbit Writer, which is a braille keyboard for mobile devices. And he'll also take a short look at other um, news related to braille note taking. So thanks also to Dan for preparing a contribution for us and I would like to have it start. Thanks. Good morning to all the participants of Agora. My name is Daniel Jungmann and today I came here to introduce to you the Orbit Writer Braille Keyboard from the Orbit Research Company. Both the company name and the product name may sound familiar to you because we've been selling for two years already the Orbit Reader 20 Braille Note Taker, which is similar to a Braille keyboard in many ways. So we will not avoid comparing when introducing this. Let's take a closer look at it. The chassis of the keyboard is made out of matte black plastic. It's 16 centimeters wide and six and a half centimeters tall, but it's very different in thickness because it's only one centimeter. Side of the upper side buttons, we can only look at the micro USB part on the left of the chassis, which is used to charge and connect to the computer. So the entire device is very compact and with its weight of 90 grams, you can take it literally anywhere. The keyboard has the same layout as the already mentioned note taker, uh, meaning eight braille keys, the navigation cursor in the middle and the space bar below that. There are no more controls and uh, to tell the truth, they're not even needed either. The keyboard can be connected to up to five different devices via Bluetooth and to one more device via USB. iOS, Android, Windows and Mac devices are supported, but also the more exotic Fire OS, Chrome OS and Linux. The battery in the keyboard can uh, last for up to three days of uh, usual usage and you can charge it in less than two hours. 
či pomocí ní so můžete No, what's going on? The Braille keyboard also has vibration feedback, which will tell you that you've turned it on or off, or you can find out the battery level. In practice, we've tried it out with iOS, Android, and Windows. Pairing to iPhone was very fast, and we could start using the keyboard immediately. A uh, uh, necessary requirement is to learn the keyboard shortcuts which the keyboard uses to control the iOS system. But these are intuitive to a great extent and they're the same as the ones that Orbit Reader 20 had. If some of them doesn't uh, suit you, it's possible to change them in the settings of the connected keyboard. We also tested this out with Android and everything seemed to be okay. Pairing with uh, JAWS is a little longer because first the keyboard itself pairs to the computer and then in order to be able to use it we have to configure JAWS but that's standard procedure and there's nothing to be worried about or afraid of. The greatest issue is currently the inability to connect the keyboard to JAWS as a standard braille display and so it's not possible to use the JAWS translation table. We believe the manufacturer will be able to fix this issue shortly, but on the other hand uh, we also need to ask what meaningful usage the braille keyboard has compared to a braille display which can be used. The braille the Braille Keyboard Orbit Writer is a small Braille keyboard which is most suitable for smartphones. To those who prefer typing in Braille, this is certainly a better keyboard than a virtual Braille keyboard on the phone screen. We believe not even the price is going to be an issue, which is set to 6,900 crowns. Now I'd like to mention more features of Braille typing that are available. The one that feels closer to this is the Orb Reader 20 note taker, which uh, I kept referring to. This one also offers, except for the already mentioned keyboard, 28 dot braille cells and quite a compact chassis weighing at 450 grams. Uh, we sell it for 23,900 crowns. Some of you asked us about a greater variant of this uh, note ticker, the Orbit Reader 40, which has been mentioned several times since last year. Even though the device does exist, we didn't find a place for it in the market after careful consideration, so we are not going to offer this model. We'll finish with a better piece of news, and that is the expansion of the scratchpad feature in the Focus Blue 5th generation Braille displays, which can be used to tap in Braille, and thanks to the scratchpad note taker, you can also write text directly in there. Scratchpad has been overhauled in the background, and it should also be faster when working with files. This also brings the increase of the maximum size of the edited file. For internal notes, the limit has been increased from 32 kilobytes to 1 megabyte, and to edit text files uploaded from the computer even to up to 10 megabytes. You can now open files of up to 100 megabytes for reading. A new submenu with uh, advanced options to configure Scratchpad has also been added. You can newly turn off word wrap, switch the scroll buttons, hide cursor when editing, and also optionally hide the dots 7 and 8, which can be distracting while reading. An expected improvement to some users may be the single-handed mode, which will allow you to control the display fully with just one hand. Also beneficial is a new Bluetooth pairing mode when you don't need to enter the confirmation code. And the last new feature are now status messages, which can only be displayed for a limited time. For example, a notification about the file being saved. This concludes our overview of Braille typing and also our presentation. Thank you for your attention and I'm passing the floor back to Radek now. Thanks to Daniel. And with this contribution, we're leaving Braille displays and note takers. And we'll take a look at the last promised part, which are which is news in the field of projects and research that in some way involve uh, the visually impaired community. In the next to last contribution, Barbara Betlova is going to introduce Atelion to us, which is a studio for assistive technologies or an atelier for assistive technologies at the ELSA Center at the Czech Technical University in Prague. And she's going to talk to us about 
what makes this department truly new in the contribution summary she mentioned it's especially a huge expansion of the target group but also for instance an emphasis on a um, on the support for tactile graphics done in a modern and uh, attractive way uh, support for tactile graphics in a braille so thanks Barbara for preparing this contribution and I'd like to have it play hello I would like to warmly welcome you to this year's autumn agora where I would like to introduce you Atelion. my name is Barbara Bertlova and I am a PhD student of special education on the Charles University although I am a newcomer in Atelion, I was uh, given this role to present Atelion in public for the first time because we can't see each other personally you can see my photo here in the picture you can see a 24 years old woman with uh, bright shoulder length hair in a white t-shirt for the introduction, let's talk about what was there before Atelian. Atelian is not a brand new workplace, but it continues almost 30 years long tradition of supporting students with visual impairment in Cheve UT. It all started with the year 1992 with the founding of Center Supporting Students with Visual Impairment by the Faculty of Nuclear Sciences and Physical Engineering. This workplace was operating across all universities and you may know it under the name Teresa. The logo of Teresa is a four years old girl with dark hair who holds the tail of guide mouse. The author of the logo is Marek Salaba. In this slide you can see the Teresa Center in the year 2003. Here are the premises of Teresa two years later and here Teresa in 2007. In 2012 uh, got the Teresa Center connected to the Center of uh, Consulting and Informational Services of Cheve UT which uh, is in the creation of a workplace for the whole university not only for students with visual impairment but with all kinds of disabilities its name is Elsa and it's a center for supporting students with special needs by the Cheve UT Elsa has a large number of technologies at the disposal but only for a narrow group which still needs to be maintained that's why the center Atelion for the assistive technology was set aside it can provide a technological base not only to students but also to public. In the photo you can see the person responsible. It's uh, no one else than uh, Radek Seifert who was there by the foundation of Teresa and now he is uh, the responsible person. In the picture you can see the same room where Teresa had its base but now it's the center atelier. You can also see how much technology fits in one room. The photo is from the year 2020 and if you want to know how the room looks now you have to come personally. And what is exactly Atelion? Atelion is an atelier or studio for users with a visual impairment which is part of ELSA, the Center for Students with Special Needs of Cheve UT. Our services are consulting, expert assessments, discussions, uh, educational activities and seminars, topical workshops uh, and uh, tryouts of uh, assistive technology. Who is the target group? Uh, we are here for students with visual impairment interested in technology that can uh, help to increase uh, their quality of life. But the change uh, which Atelion brings is the focus on expert public. These are people as well as organizations where uh, the people with visual impairment are the target group. In Atelion we are aware of uh, the lack of these groups uh, when talking about uh, technical consulting. That's why our services are also available to them. Areas of our work include uh, working with uh, low vision, further its adaptation to accessible formats, tactile graphics and uh, the possibilities of 3D printing. As said before, Atelion is uh, focused on technology. Now I would like to introduce you some technologies and aids that we use and that you can also use in our center. Aids, devices and advancements uh, at disposal of uh, Atelion cover the whole area of supporting people with uh, visual impairment. Starting with uh, easy aids uh, meant to teach uh, the braille visual technologies such as electronic magnifiers text digitalization uh, 
uh, working with uh, screen readers and uh, braille displays uh, and ending with uh, diflographics, 3D models and, uh, and tactile maps. For illustration, I would uh, also like to introduce some uh, specific technologies. In Italian, we have several fusers. One of them is the fuser of the brand Ziffuse. Here is a document printed on microcapsule paper. Here is a ready copy from the fuser where thanks to heat uh, the black uh, surface became tactile. Another slide shows uh, the ready copy. In this case it uh, Janáčkovo nábreží or Janáček's uh, riverbank. Another device is uh, the printer Everest indexed V5 that prints in braille. In this photo is uh, the printer itself. Here it's uh, the printer during printing and as every braille printer it's not a quiet device so we have here this separated room for it. The last picture shows uh, the ready braille print. We also have some uh, devices that are unique in the Czech Republic and uh, that you can see only by colleagues in Theresia Center. Such a device is the printer and print spot dot that prints braille as well as graphics. In the first slide you can see the printer itself. On another is the print here the map of uh, regions in the Czech Republic. In the last slide uh, is uh, a plan also printed on this printer. The last technology that I want to introduce is the device uh, Iveo. It's a, a large tablet combined with a computer program that enables going through materials not only by hearing but also by touching. The template is uh, placed on the tablet and the corresponding file in uh, the computer program needs to be open. Then when you click on uh, a concrete point on the template, uh, a spoken commentary will start. Now I would like to introduce you our latest project, because one of the goals of Atelier is the spreading of uh, tactile graphics and braille. We created so-called Matak or Toucher, a tactile flyer with uh, braille descriptions which is sent by post and for free. First, Matak introduced uh, the regions of the Czech Republic, including the capital cities. You can see the sheet uh, in the photo. In another slide is the whole content of uh, Matak number one. These are the folders, uh, the graphical paper and uh, descriptions in braille. Now we also have the second edition of Matak, uh, as our users wished. Uh, uh, it's uh, focused on the regions of Slovakia. How can I order Matak? You can do so through our email atelian at elza.cvut.cz. Please state your whole name and uh, the address and the number of flyer we want to order. Or you can use the order form on our Facebook. Atelion, comma, Atelier Assistivních Technologií Trediska Elza, comma, ČVUT. Uh, Hmatak is uh, not only for readers with visual impairment, but also for others who are interested. So don't hesitate and order. At uh, the end, I would like to conclude the main topics of this presentation. First, Atelier is not a separate uh, workplace, but a part of uh, Center Elsa that uh, focuses on uh, assistive technology for people with visual impairment. Second, uh, Atelier has uh, broadened uh, the target group to all people who are interested in the topic of uh, visual impairment, who, who work with them or who want to learn more about their assistive technology. And third, in Ethereum we think that uh, receiving information via touch or uh, via reading braille, dis braille script is uh, also important in the 21st century even more than before. Also, that's why we created Hamatak. Uh, through which we want to distribute the diflographics and braille among a large number of people. Lastly, I would like to give you context, 
the number to our office is 224-358-543. The email is atelion at elza.cvut. Our Facebook is uh, Atelion Atelier Assistivních Technologií Střediska Elza, Koma CVUT. Our web is www.elza.cvut.cz and our address is Trojanova 13. If you would like to come personally, don't hesitate, contact us and come to our address. That's all for me. I would like to thank you and uh, I hope that uh, we will see each other personally either in uh, our workplace on or on another Agora conference. Thanks to Baro for introducing Atelion. And I wish a lot of success, uh, a lot of happy users and clients. In the last contribution of today's Fall Agora, we're going to take a look at a matter which I personally see as a very important. The program is going to be concluded by the contribution of the, uh, the Faculty of Arts of Masaryk Technology, uh, Masaryk University, Monika Milana, Teresa Bilanova and Zuzana Lesnikovska, where they're going to present the first results of their research about the level or measure of accessibility of the information about not just the government measures to the visually impaired during the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite the coronavirus, uh, coronavirus has uh, influenced a lot of things positively. Let's mention at least a very quick uh, improved accessibility of uh, the UI of the dis remote communication tools, which is what enables us to communicate here today like this and uh, enables you to uh, enables even those who are who are visually impaired or do not see at all to take part uh, but also a lot of these measures have brought also negative impacts with them and because the hard data that there's a there's only a few hard data uh, that uh, talk about the experience of users uh, and can be used in uh, when reacting to these situations uh, I'm very glad that this research uh, has taken place and that we have uh, already some first results available today. So thanks to the colleagues and uh, I would like to have the last contribution played. Hello, first we would like to thank the organizers of the Agora conference for the opportunity to present here the results of our research. As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has influenced our lives and the governmental measures had been changing by day. Were the pieces of information uh, available to the visually impaired in time? Were they accessible and uh, which barriers did the visually impaired had to face? All of this is the subject of the research, which is focused on the matter of informational behavior of the visually impaired. Now we will make you familiar with the results. The research has been uh, realized by the team of four, by Teresa Bilanova, Monika Teichmanova, Hanna Malinova and Zuzana Lysnikovska. We did master studies in uh, Masaryk University in collaboration with uh, the Theresia Center. Today we'll present Monika Teichmanova and my colleague Hanna Malinova. The results will be provided to accessibility experts of the Czech government, to the Theresia Center, other organizations, uh, web, de web designers and uh, others interested. Uh, right in the beginning we found out that it's a burning problem that needs to be discussed. The research consists of uh, multiple thematic parts, uh, we try to find the answers through uh, research questions. We found out uh, which informational sources the visually impaired use, uh, which uh, changes they perceive, which barriers they had to face and uh, if the information was accessible and uh, what emotions they experienced and uh, what would help the visually impaired with perceiving the governmental measures. Our theory was grounded in the inclusive design and uh, disability studies.
engaging with the accessibility of products and services, including people with disabilities uh, and uh, they also uh, removing barriers. Uh, the first step of our research was, was the realization of explorative uh, research in the form of four half-structured interviews with blind so that we get closer to the topic uh, which uh, connects the blind people and uh, which barriers they face. Based on the interview analysis, we composed uh, questions to the research form. As the platform for the form, we have chosen Google Forms. Except for totally and uh, like legally blind, we also included other groups of the visually impaired, so that we afterwards can uh, define the specifics of the blind population, and so that we can notice other problems caused by the inaccessibility. Specifically, it concerned uh, 36 uh, totally blind people, 34 legally blind, 7 respondents with low vision and 7 partially sighted. In total, 81 respondents took part and the data collections uh, was uh, realized in May to July 2021. That's it to the introduction of our research, now we will look at the results. Uh, the first part uh, was uh, searching for the answer to the question if the governmental measures are uh, accessible to the visually impaired so that they can react on them in time. The answer was uh, that uh, one quarter uh, found uh, barriers uh, uh, thanks to which uh, the information was not provided in time so that they couldn't react in time. Another question was uh, focused on the informational sources. The answers were following uh, websites, TV, mobile apps, uh, radio, but also SMS messages. The most mentioned uh, uh, resource was uh, Novinky.cz, ct24 and Erouška. More than the half of the respondents preferred uh, SMS messages. In the beginning, the Ministry of Health informed uh, by SMS messages, but this measure was cancelled afterwards. It's also important to say that no respondent stated the official website of the Ministry of Health as they main informational source. They rather read online news where there is a higher risk of uh, inaccurate information. One respondent says, I rather preferred uh, news like uh, Novinky CZ uh, where the information was much more understandable and transparent than on the official website of the government. Following uh, this answer, uh, in our research, we also asked uh, about the accessibility of a website of the Ministry of Health. The results aren't really good. Most of the respondents uh, uh, was not satisfied with the accessibility. They described the website as uh, chaotic and uh, that's why they found the information in other more accessible sources. Uh, some people say that this accessibility got better in time. As uh, one respondent says, the orientation wasn't really easy. When there was a table or a graphic, I needed to ask someone else to read it for me. We also asked the respondents if they would wish to the websites to have a special section for the visually impaired. This would be welcome only by one third of the respondents. The remaining two-thirds agreed that uh, the websites should be uh, accessible for all and they are afraid that uh, such sections wouldn't be updated. One respondent says, as a deaf person can't uh, appreciate the music of Beethoven, a blind person can't perceive the beauty of Renaissance art. We have to only reconcile. In the world of internet this means that there will be always inaccessible websites. But an informational website should be designed that way that it's accessible to all, including blind people using screen readers or braille displays. Now I will give the word to my colleague Hanna Malinova who will uh, talk about the second part of the research and who will present the ideas for improvement. 
Hello, thank you. Uh, our next uh, question was if there were some changes in the informational behavior, but also in the information provided themselves. One fourth of the respondents had to change the way they search for information, which was reflected by using uh, different new sources, including the sources from abroad. And the information was also verified more consistently. Also, one fourth perceived that there are continuous changes in the system, either positive or negative. Uh, in some regions, uh, info lines were introduced continuously, which was a good solution for some respondents, but it was also often difficult to get connected to this line. Afterwards, Afterwards it, was it was providing, providing the information, the information about, about the government, government measures, measures through, through the local, local diffluent diffluent centers. centers or organizations for the blind and uh, lastly the already mentioned SMS messages which were introduced and afterwards cancelled. Further, we asked uh, which barriers the visually impaired face when searching for the information about the pandemics. One respondent says, I think that the informational providence has changed to the better. At least I have the feeling they are no more so chaotic as before. The biggest problem was the inaccessibility of uh, websites for screen readers, such as uh, searching in uh, maps with the pandemic numbers and the graphs with the numbers of infected uh, without uh, alternative descriptions. Infographics in the PES system, but also inaccessible tweets uh, shown as photos of long posts and also PDF documents on the website of the Ministry of Health. Another problem was the incompleteness of information uh, caused by uh, unclear system settings, uh, but also because of the misinterpretation in the media. Uh, so people weren't sure what information is up to date or if the uh, restrictions are also imposed on the disabled when talking about exceptions from the restrictions. One fourth also needed help uh, by another person when uh, searching for the information and uh, this applied to all kinds of uh, visual impairment. There was also low awareness uh, by the shop staff who were not instructed how to deal with uh, a person with visual impairment and respecting the needs of the visual impaired was then a more personal solution on the side of the shop assistant because it was not clearly defined by the government. This mostly uh, applied to the rule one person to one shopping cart but also there were problem with uh, the disinfection or social distancing. Vaccination was and still is uh, a very discussed topic, so we were also interested uh, if the center registration system is accessible to the visually impaired so that they can register themselves alone. Uh, the results are that one half of the respondents uh, regardless of their visual impairment uh, needed help by the registration. When it comes to the vaccination centers, uh, most of the respondents uh, came with an assistant and when they didn't, uh, there were problems so with orientation in uh, big uh, hospitals and uh, help uh, by people passing by was needed. Uh, the staff in the vaccination center was however perceived uh, very well and helpful. The feelings uh, people felt uh, during uh, the information search about the pandemics could help us uh, to perceive the emotions they felt and they can bring up new ideas in the research. And we found that the emotions they felt uh, were mostly frustration, helplessness and anger, but also reconciliation and hope. If we should conclude proposals for improvement, they would be clear definition of conditions for people with disabilities, stick to the legislative and think about the accessibility rules, such as structured heading, uh, advertisements, uh, unlogical structure, captchas uh, and uh, P PDF. Al although it may be considered for a standard, sometimes people basically don't think about it. It showed up that a functional solution was uh, the sending of SMS messages uh, during the pandemics where half of our respondents used this service. But they were often available 
first one day later and uh, that's why they were cancelled it, it would uh, be uh, considerable to think uh, about to send these messages only on demand because it was for some people a uh, highly informative and accessible source of getting information the problem wasn't with the access to the information but uh, more the comprehensibility and logicality of the information in specific phases of the pandemics where the sms messages solved the problem in the conclusion, we would like to mention uh, an interesting facts uh, by the respondents, which were not primarily connected to our research, but which are worth mentioning. There were problems with uh, getting assistive technology in time because of long waiting time. In uh, orientation in the medical centers, where we can suppose that these things have no connections to the pandemic specifically. Another resonating topic was uh, the behavior of people. Sometimes occurred even arrogance, incomprehension or aggression caused by unclear measures such as uh, people with visual impairment experience for example in shops. Uh, during the third initial interviews uh, problems were mentioned such as uh, the inaccessibility of documents on the International Library of Cramerius which provided uh, access to books to students uh, because uh, libraries were closed but uh, due to the GDPR uh, visually impaired people couldn't uh, work with the documents, which complicated their studies. Sending the document in alternative format took a long time and it was uh, not effective. At the end, we would like to mention that we are aware that our research is not covering the whole topic uh, and all situation faced by the visually impaired and our goal was only to focus on informational behavior and informational sources and to try to define those problems we are aware of it uh, of our limits and uh, one uh, our respondent says in the form and we would like to thank her the questionnaire is uh, not dealing with some important topics uh, what influenced us was also loss of job and life certainties uh, uh, the blind people had to deal with the chaos but also with existence problems also the form doesn't uh, talk about the fact that uh, uh, blind people can have uh, unimpaired children and uh, it was uh, really difficult for the parents to to deal with the whole education from home as well as technically as uh, psychologically the questionnaire deals only with limited range of uh, problems visually impaired people had to face and still face this would this would be everything from us we would like to thank you for the attention and also to the participants of the research as well as the Theresia center and the department of it on the masaryk university namely radek pavliček our consultant Nicole and uh, the designer Terka. If you have questions uh, for us, uh, please contact us. Our email is uh, dotaznikovipruskum uh, at gmail.com. Thank you. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the colleagues for this activity and not only to them, but also to everyone who has uh, taken part on the Fall Agora 2021, because as we've already mentioned, this was the last contribution of its plenary session. So huge thanks to Santa Chermakova, to Radim Kharvat, Peter Peñas for the introductory speeches, to all the presenters who have prepared very interesting and informationally rich uh, contributions to all the colleagues from our team who helped to organize this and last but not least of course to our interpreters Pavlina and Lukash who have uh, moved over the entire content to English and thus made it accessible also to those who do not understand Czech. Uh, that's about everything for the plenary session.
you're uh, I'm sure you're asking what it's gonna be like with the workshops unfortunately we've also been hit uh, by COVID even in this department so we're not mm, able during to offer the workshops during November and December in the usual numbers we usually have so we um, we've uh, agreed on offering the workshops also in the beginning of next year's uh, next year 2022 both online as well as where possible uh, physically so please keep following the Agora website the, the Posla blog uh, the Teresias Center Facebook and all the other usual information channels uh, via which uh, we inform about the activities of Agora the workshop which is currently scheduled is focused on the Bino trail display as Petra Blaha talked about it. The workshop is going to take place already this Monday on the 29th of November starting at 4 30 p.m. again via Zoom and if you would like to register for it please uh, uh, write me an email at P A V L I C E K at T E I R E public uh, at Teresias dot gmail dot com dot muni dot cz public check at Teresias dot muni dot cz and I'll inform you further. Uh, for the next up uh during uh, uh today this afternoon you can join our colleagues on the clubhouse network in the techco plus room where we also take part of on behalf of agora by uh archiving audio recordings from the event and writing articles that reflect what takes place during these meetings we publish them together with a lot of other information on our uh educational portal Pelion, where we try to put information today not just in Czech, uh, these days these days not just in Czech but also in English so for those of you who are interested in the topic of 3d printing for instance you can find there already several articles in English uh, dedicated to 3d printing and educating the visually impaired using 3d printing uh, con uh, regarding next year's Agora, I think no one dares to estimate anymore what's going to be or what's not going to be because the time is really turbulent and a lot of things are not within our power. So the plan is for us uh, to on the 14th and 15th of May to organize uh, the physical form of Agora if the circumstances allow. If not, then we would uh, meet up uh, online once again. But uh, nevertheless, we're going to meet up online also next fall because since next year, Agora are going to, Agoras are going to be uh, run in the mode of uh, the physical or hybrid in the spring agoras because we also want to broadcast and offer part of the program remotely and the fall program because as you may have noticed since uh, starting next year we're uh, taking over our partner event inspo uh, organizationally and that is going to be taking place physically in the fall so in order to be able to manage everything uh, and organize everything together that's why we decided for this model so if someone uh, uh, some of you are interested in the b-note workshop then uh, feel free to write to me if uh, you someone wants to offer during december or starting next year january february uh, some other workshop considering um that we'll also list the ones we had offered uh, we had prepared for now but that we could not organize then please also let me know follow the information channels that i've mentioned and uh, not just for myself but also on behalf of our entire team i'll be looking forward to other meetings uh, opportunities to meet you both virtually and uh, physically 
um, both under the Agora banner and under the Inspo banner. Once again, thanks a lot to all of you for um, taking your time to watch Agora either uh, live or from the archives. Be well, stay healthy, and let's stay in touch. And let's try to think together about how we could further improve this event of ours. Thanks a lot. Mm. Be, be well and goodbye.